Um, what we thought we would do in 25 minutes or so is spend five minutes each giving you reflections on what we've heard in the past day or so, and then spend the rest of our time talking about our experience in the social media world. We're both active tweeters. Uh, I think one can come away from this meeting if you're not on Twitter or social media with a pretty negative feeling that it's just a big cesspool out there and why would I want to engage? Everybody's telling me I should engage, but why would I want to? And I think both of us have had relatively positive experiences and have learned a ton over the last several years uh, doing social media and there are some lessons from that. So we'll spend most of our time talking about that. Let's just start out with a few general reflections. Uh, let, me, let me start with mine. Uh, I think it's been very thoughtful to frame a lot of the discussion as not just about misinformation, not just about social media, but about the, this threat of anti-elitism in the, in the American culture and sort of other threat of this libertarian streak that the society has that sort of rejects uh, elites and rejects uh, organizations. And of course, those have been long-standing threads in American culture, but they have been massively enabled by the idea that everybody has a megaphone. And you know, think about how different that was than 30, 40 years ago. If you wanted to get your point of view out, uh, maybe there was the op-ed uh, or letters to the editor in your local newspaper when there was one. But there was really no mechanism to do that. There were arbiters of news, and those have gone away. So I think Im very important to frame and think deeply about this issue of, uh, of, of sort of uh, elitism and, uh, and expertise and all of that. That's part of what we have to spend some time uh, addressing. With that, it struck me that there's been a thread in medicine, including in this organization for the last 20 or 30 years, a very healthy thread that says that medicine has been too paternalistic, uh, that it's been too top-down, that it's been the elites talking to everyone else, sometimes talking at everyone else. It's been physicians as the credentialed experts telling patients what they should do and think. And we have pushed very hard to empower patients, to hear the voices of patients, uh, uh, nothing about me without me, very, very important threads. And, and we can have to reflect deeply on what divides that thread of getting non-credentialed experts in the room and making sure that we're listening to their voices and the role of misinformation and things that we're hearing from uh, non-credentialed experts that bother us. And I, I don't know how to draw that line, but it strikes me in some ways that it's a logical extension of something that's really, I think, quite a positive trend in healthcare over the last uh, over the last 20 years or so, um, I want to say something that is a uh, two things that are a bummer. In case you're not bummed out enough, one is that as much as we're all bothered, I think, or I think most of us are bothered by miscommunication and and some of the uh, threats to the profession. Um, it's probably going to get worse, and it's going to get worse because the way that healthcare is going to be delivered is going to be more consumer centric, less institution centric, more through your app and through digital means. There's a huge universe of startups out there that are digital first, that really are designed to disrupt the, uh, the institutions that are those institutions that are the ones that are, quote, credible on YouTube and as we think about it. And as that environment swirls, um, it's going to create more opportunities for potential misinformation for patients diagnosing themselves using digital tools. And um, so this may be the easy part of the battle where patients still mostly come to see doctors in offices, go to hospitals, go to emergency rooms. Uh, in a future world where they're doing less of that, that this may be even harder. The second bummer, uh, and maybe that'll be the last thing I say, is that we started with COVID vaccines and we generalized it to, oh my God, the next thing is, is measles We're, and next thing is polio. I don't see any bright line between vaccines and the way we treat hypertension, the way we treat cancer, the whether you should get a colonoscopy, uh, all of that stuff. Now, there is a little bit of a line there in terms of what things are being mandated, and the mandate, of course, becomes the fodder for the libertarian streak to take over, and who are you, who made you the boss of me, which is not the case. Nobody mandates to get a colonoscopy. But, um, and there's the second thing about vaccines, which is the community benefit and the issues of infections being different than your own personal MI or stroke or, or colon cancer. But I think those are subtle lines, 
And I think that, the, uh, that right now we're in an environment where most of the pushback and the misinformation is about this very specific sliver of the healthcare universe called vaccines. I don't see any reason that it stays there. And so the threats to what physicians and other clinicians and organizations that deliver care do, I think, are likely to be generalized beyond the narrow world of vaccines, with vaccines being just the entry point. So maybe I'll stop there and hand it over to Kimberly. Thank you. Is this thing on? It is. All right. Um, thanks again for having me here. I just have to say that. So I, I was really, um, I had an aha moment, and then there was a lot that struck me. So I'm going to hold the aha moment after the struck part. So uh, I really was drawn to the piece about um, the learning journey, the learning journey of the process of us figuring out who is trustworthy and who is not, what works, what doesn't. On this day, this worked, this didn't. Um, and I think that's something that we can all take away. Um, what you try on one day, you will find doesn't work perfectly, and then you keep kind of making adjustments, very similar to doing an experiment, right? Um, so one slide that stood out to me was the slide, um, and I, uh, it was from the New York Health Department. Um, love that presentation, shout out to you. And it, and it showed how they initially started with these videos that looked like our standard sterile medical doctor videos. You should be vaccinated, here's the data. And then they shifted it over to storytelling. But one of the things that um, wasn't highlighted that I'm sure because they didn't have that much time to highlight it was that those initial videos, um, they were longer than the ones that were the story videos. And so one of the lessons learned actually is that for, for people to get the information, it has to be digestible and in a way that they'll actually consume it. Um, so when we heard the mention of the 58 minute video, right, ain't nobody gonna watch something that's 58 minutes unless it's on Netflix. Um, <laughs> But they, but they will watch a one minute video of somebody who looks like them and that they can identify with telling their story. So that piece really struck me and I think that all of us can keep reflecting on our own learning journeys in this process of building trust. The big aha moment I had though, um, and it's probably something that I've been feeling for a while and it's probably why um, presentations like what we just heard from our grantees work so well, it is that these communities that we keep talking about, these people that we keep trying to reach, we are in those communities. We're the people too, we're the consumers too, right? And so if I'm going to try to design something to help people to trust more in the African American community, there's urgency because I'm in that community too. I have a mother, I have family, I, you know, so, and, and being in that community isn't just about racial and cultural concordance. If you are there caring for patients at Grady Hospital, you have inserted yourself into that community and now you are a stakeholder. You're a piece of that community and there's something in it for you to care about. And so this idea of us kind of being in roles and somebody on stage talking to someone, um, I try very hard to think more about us in circles, in a huddle, thinking together about what we're going to do um, for our communities, right? And I think this is why we've seen this work so well in some of the historically excluded groups and community-based organizations that have really gone out and um, been boots to the ground. The other thing that stood out to me, too, as we saw some of the examples of ways to build trust is about language. Um, Words really do matter, um, and, I, and I will just take a point of privilege as you know, a person who is a descendant of human beings who were enslaved against their will and survived, um, that language matters. So what I just said to you was, as a descendant of human beings who were enslaved against their will and survived, that sounds different than saying that I'm a descendant of slaves, because I'm not. So the people that I would be caring for at Grady Hospital, and as we listened to some of the things we heard, um, who were, for example, vaccine hesitant. Um, the language of vaccine hesitant conveys one thing, and that could erode trust by itself. Vaccine deliberation gives me agency. And then I can say, oh, 
I'm trying to decide whether or not I wish to be vaccinated or not, and you value me enough to allow me to do that. And I and and as we as we heard a lot of the examples uh, so far, I think us and because I'm again I'm just trying to think about us being action oriented when we walk away from here. What we can do, some of the things we can do is also think about for us as trusted people. What language, what simple things are we are, are causing people to slam the door in our face because we haven't really thought about that? So vaccine hesitancy, um, the Tuskegee study, right? As a proud graduate of Tuskegee University, I never refer to it as that. I always think of Tuskegee as a place of black excellence and that the untreated syphilis study happened in Macon County, Alabama. And, but, but, um, we are the ones who perpetuated those narratives, and those are things that um, really start to erode the trust. So um, I, 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 the, one of the early sessions, um, specifically when Helen was talking about training people to sort of know how to bring this information forward, there's some just concrete things that um, I'm really excited to see what happens next with, like, hey, this is how you make, um, if you're gonna make a video, it needs to be under a one minute and 30 seconds, or ain't nobody gonna listen to it. It needs to be already embedded into whatever you're doing. They shouldn't have to click and go over to YouTube because they're gonna shut it off if they have to do that, or they're gonna start to look at other stuff on YouTube, right? Okay. Um, if you're going to say something, you may want to think about um, that part about when we were talking about that sort of the, the, the part where you think ahead before it, rather than the whack-a-mole. I really like that. Um, before you get to the whack-a-mole, you could probably predict where the mole is going to pop up. You see the holes in the floor. So you just say, all right, cool. If I say this, then let me think in advance how I might say this. So I will give you one concrete example before we move to the other part. The concrete example is that last week, um, many of us read an article in the Wall Street Journal. A lot of us had a lot of feelings about it. If you haven't read it, then you just need to talk to your neighbor because I'm not going to tell you about it. <laughs> But what I will say is that a lot of people in medical education had a lot of feelings, particularly those who um, care about the, the work in diversity, equity, and inclusion, okay? So when you get ready to write something about that on a big platform, you, this is, whack-a-mole ain't gonna work for that. You're gonna have to sit down for a minute and think, who am I? Who follows me? Who am I reaching? Who might see this? And how can I, with my unique identity and my voice, how can I say something about this that um, could potentially do help and not good? I mean, do good and, and not hurt, right? So what good can come from what I'm about to do? Am I about to just, you know, do I need to get something off my chest? What, what, how am I going to do this? And then go from there. Now, I would be lying to you if I said I was always so wise that I always do it that way. Sometimes I just get flared up and I'm like, yo, did y'all see this? And then I have to whack-a-mole it. Um, but I think um, that the takeaway piece is if we can teach um, each other how to maybe take those three steps back and look predictably at how our communication, what it might lead to, some things we can't even predict. Um, but some things we can predict what's going to happen. Um, and, and also some things are so egregious that if you care a lot about students and you care about a particular thing, you, you're going you're gonna to speak from your heart. And some people don't like when you speak from your heart. So, you know, no shade to anybody that has. So I, I, I'm going to stop right there. But I do think I, I love this idea of us thinking about how to help people use their unique identities either in organizations or as individuals or um, as credible sources who are embedded in credible spaces that count as credible sources? How can we get some type of playbook so that we can learn from some of the whack-a-mole that we've had to deal with in the past? Great, thanks. So let me spend a few minutes on my Twitter experience and then you can do okay. the same and we'll kind of uh, go from there. I, one of the things that you said that was really insightful is we're all used to this idea of a learning, learning health system and you know, systems or people that learn from their experience and integrate what they found into what they do next. Uh, one of the things I learned early on in the digital world, I remember I was doing some work with Google, must have been 15 years ago, and I was uh, talking to the person who was in charge of Google search. And he said to me, how often do you think we change the search algorithm? And I said, I don't know, once a month, once every couple of months, I don't know. He said, three or four times a day. 
It says, because everything that happens, we are looking at and, and saying, that worked. You know, you searched, and the first result was what you clicked on. That worked. <clears throat> you searched, and the, the fifth result was what you clicked on. We need to optimize it. You searched, and you had to go to page two. That's like a code blue goes off at Google. That's just like, oh my god, we got to fix it. They are constant, and that is probably the biggest mindset difference between di the digital world and the analog world, that everything that people do gives you information that you should take in and learn from. So I think both of us have had this experience. You know, One of the things that happens when you're in social media is you're putting stuff out there, but you're getting stuff back. You're getting stuff back in responses. You're getting stuff back in terms of how many people liked it and retweeted and all that, and sort of it gives you an opportunity to do something that's very different than any other walk of life prior to this, which is say, huh, that led to engagement. That seemed to be interesting to people. I'll do more of that, or I'll do, I'll do less of that. Uh, my own personal story was I started blogging probably 15, 20 years ago when that was a thing. And then when Twitter came around, it was like, oh, I can do it, but do it in fewer characters and take less time. So I started doing it. I had, and I was doing it about things were, that were interesting to me, which of course is one of the key lessons is you have to figure out your lane. Like, what do you, what do you want to be talking about? What do you like to do? What are the issues that interest you? It takes time, so you have to make sure it's stuff that you care about. And so I was doing it on some little bit of medical education, a little bit of hospitalists, a little bit of digital transformation. Uh, and I had probably about 15,000 followers. And then COVID hit, and I remember it was, I think, March 16th, 2020, and I was sitting in my house, actually under my kitchen table, and, um, and I actually had nothing to do, which was bizarre, because I run a very large department with 1,000 physicians, but UCSF had gone to a form of martial law, we had four or five people in the command center that were making all decisions. And I was spending my entire day taking in information. And you know, Zoom meetings from morning to night. And I said, this is intensely interesting. It's intensely confusing. I'm pretty sure that a lot of people are going to care about this. I'm not an expert in any part of this. I am not an expert in infectious diseases, epidemiology, public health, aerosol science, any of that. But I'm decent at sort of taking stuff in and trying to make sense of it. And so I said, maybe that'll be my lane and I'll try to take in what I'm hearing from my colleagues, what I'm learning, and put it out there. And I did that and it was like, I think the movie, uh, uh, I forget, maybe, maybe The Social Network, where you put it out there and you look at the little like button and all of a sudden it's like spinning around. It's like, holy moly, what's going on here? And so I, that became, I said, okay, I'll keep doing that. Um, and I have to say, it's been one of the most gratifying things I've experienced in my life in healthcare. Um, in terms of, you know, when, when, when faculty come to me and say, should I do this? If you think about what we're here to do for a living, it's to, it's to get the word out about things that are important and truths that are important and things that improve people's health. And I can put out an article in a journal, I won't say which journal, but any journal really, and sometimes you'll have five people come up to you or 10 people come up to you and they say, you know, I saw your article. They actually rarely say, I read your article. <laughs> they say, I saw your article. Whereas here, I can actually look at the metrics on Twitter and see that 100,000 people have looked at something I've put out. It, it's caused to be fairly careful and be sure you didn't get it wrong. Uh, but the level of engagement and the level of, sort of the level of reach is unlike anything I've ever seen before. What I have done and chosen to do, and Kimberly's done some of the same thing, one of the real choices to make is how personal to be. And I came to believe that really nobody cares what I had for breakfast. And um, uh, although one of my most kind of popular tweets was very, very early on where I, I showed the, the can of SpaghettiOs and the double stuffed Oreos that I'd had for lunch and felt like this was like the perfect food because I was so scared and it was so chaotic. But, but there is a level of authenticity that draws people. It's sort of on the same gene as the storytelling thing. That if you're the dispassionate science and you're just doing the science, that's fine. And if you don't follow, if you're thinking about going on Twitter and you care about COVID, I'd follow Eric Topol over anyone who has taken to do this unbelievable public service of basically annotating the entire literature. And in real time, it's unbelievable. And I don't know how he does it. But um, so that's one way to do it. I decided relatively early on that I'm gonna do a little bit of that, but a lot of synthesis and a lot of this is how I'm thinking about it. 
And every now and then, this is what I am doing. You don't have to do it. And, and my younger son just got COVID, and I tried calling him, and he didn't answer the phone till 10 in the morning. And I knew for sure he wasn't dead, but there was a part of my brain that said, I wonder if he died. And, uh, and he was testing positive till day seven. And I said, you know, CDC says he's good to go, but I wouldn't want him to hug me. Now, you have to then be ready, because I got all the Twitter people came out, and they said, you are such a shitty parent. <laughs> There's nothing my child could do or have that would make me not want to hug him. And I'm, I'm thinking, like, this is a potentially fatal infectious disease. <laughs> And he's 27 years old. He doesn't need me to hug him. You know, he can go, he can go for a couple of days without me hugging him. So there's a risk to being that authentic and that personal. But I have found that a lot of people now follow me because they say, I may not do exactly what you're doing, but I want to hear what you're doing. I want to hear what you're thinking. And that's very different than anything I was trained to do as a scientist and a sort of dispassionate academic. And you've done a lot of the same thing. I mean, your, your, your feed is very personal, a lot of pictures of what you're doing, and really compelling and in a, in a storytelling way. So let me hand it over to you. I used to follow Wachter's World back in the day. Yeah, right. Yes, I remember that. So I'm aging myself. Um, so, so one of the things I, I, will, I first want to say is that, you know, though social media has been mostly positive for me, um, and, and, I, and I am myself, I'm not anonymous or anything like that. It's risky, it's a risky space to be in. People are mean, um, people are crazy, people can find us because we're in academic medical centers. We have children, we have people who love us who are private. Um, and so um, that, that is one like piece of the risk that you take and if that's not your jam, um, if you're risk averse, this might not be for you. Um, but but I, I just know from some of my peers in the room that we've all had our experiences with things that have not always been positive on these platforms. That being said, um, my journey is that I, I started with a blog as well. My blog was not as big as Wachter's World. Um, but it was, uh, I just started blogging um, because I wanted a space to write without rules. And I kept writing narratives and I would send them to journals and they were rejected. And I was like, this was dope. I'm about to put this on my blog. Um, <laughs> so, over pra um, so with practice, um, I, I started to get better and stronger. And I think one of the things about these platforms is it's like distance running. The way to run distance is to run distance. You learn how to breathe, you learn how to pace yourself, you learn how to do it. And so when I moved over to Twitter, um, I, I, and um, I will just back up and say, I have a Facebook account, but, but my Facebook account was already alive and well, and all the people that I followed on Facebook, they knew me in real life. So when I really got active on Twitter, I, I said, I'm gonna tweet in a box. I'm gonna be mission driven. I'm gonna be like, what should I be talking about as me, right? And, and how, how, what should I amplify as me? Um, and, and I think when I started doing that, um, again, that whole learning journey with it, it started to grow and grow and grow. M my pivotal moment happened um, with the murder of Mr. George Floyd. Um, there were people that I already knew that sort of worked in social justice and in the DEI space, but um, I, I, I started to thoughtfully try to share things. And I thought a lot about things like, what happens with a hashtag? What happens if I amplify the voice of somebody like LaShira Nolan giving a rap talking about what it's like to be a black woman from Compton? Um, these were things that I actually started to think like, man, you know, it's like when Toni Morrison wrote The Bluest Eye, it was the book she wanted to read. I write the thread that I wish that I could find when I was a black medical student at Meharry back in the day. And so with time, I learned little things, and this is where I hope, again, where we can teach people. If you write a story on Twitter, um, I actually found out that if I start with a picture, um, people read it to the end more than if I don't have a picture. If the picture is of a face, it actually, people follow it all the way through more. And I would like struggle would be like, oh, it's probably self-important to always have a face, selfie of me in front of Grady. Um, but I want you to read what I wrote and I pay attention to how many engagements I have on the first tweet and how many I have on the last tweet. That was just, I just, was I just want to say, if it were my face, fewer people would read it. I think it's, it really is your face. You know what, you know what, Bob? You just need better filters. Yeah, and, I'm a, <laughs> and, I, and I can talk to, I can show you how to do that. Cause honey, a filter will have y'all clicking on Bob. But, um, 
but, 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 that, but that's just a little simple example. I started finding out how to use dialogue, right? The dialogue I used on my blog looks very different than the dialogue that I use over Twitter. I found that when I started to create dialogue, it, may, it, it started to make people read it more. And so when we got to the point of vaccine um, uptake issues and vaccine deliberation, I had my Toni Morrison moment. I was like, I'm so tired of what I'm reading here. People are totally misunderstanding the community I'm in. This is not what I'm hearing from black people. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna tell stories that are authentic, that are de-identified so that people can actually get it. Instead of me only talking in a corner to other black people, I'm gonna use this platform and go forward facing and let people see what it is that's happening in the community when I'm standing in a parking lot at Publix, right? And, um, and I think what happened is that people started saying, oh wow, okay, I got this from that, I got this from that. But what I will tell you is that you do have to kind of have some thick skin. There were some times where things happened that hurt my feelings. I'm still a person who has feelings. And the biggest time my feelings got hurt on social media was when, um, because of the platform of, of um, Twitter, I got on the radar of, of um, BET and Tyler Perry, and I did a discussion of um, vaccine deliberation with Tyler Perry. It reached a lot of people, and overwhelmingly, it was positive. But there was a pocket of my people who did not appreciate it at all. And I was talking like I talked, because I really just made a decision to stop code switching, so I was just talking like a black woman from Inglewood who went to two HBCUs. And there were people who were like, she dumbing it down for us, she talking jive, she trying to be hood. And I was like, I'm not, I'm just from Inglewood, this is how I talk. Um, <laughs> but it was really hurtful, because this was not a group of crazy people who are from some group that don't like black people. These were my folks. And I had to say to myself, you know, it's just like that discussion about don't let perfection stop you from doing the things that you really need to do. Overwhelmingly, we reached a lot more people and it was a positive thing. But I'm also, um, I also learned from, from some of the feedback, even the feedback that hurts. I take a step back and I look at it and I say, well, I know you reviewer too, but sometimes reviewer too got something good to tell you. <laughs> so um, I listened at, at some of those things, even though it hurt, um, and tried to say, okay, how can I now curate my thread even more so that I'm not alienating the people I actually love the most? <laughs> no shade to y'all, but, you know. Um, so so I, I just like that, that part about the learning journey, um, and, and for me, that's made a difference. And the last plug I'll say about social media is that if you're trying to get promoted, y'all, when I went from having like 10,000 followers to where I am now, not 200 or something, I have 100,000 followers or so, it, le it leads to you getting on the radar of people who never read your papers, right? And so in that year, 2020 to 2021, I probably had like over 20 visiting professorships at places that I applied to for medical school that did not give me an interview. <laughs> and I made sure to let them know that y'all didn't even interview me. <laughs> <laughs> so there. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it's been very positive for me, but I do think that um, being yourself and not being anonymous and being okay with sometimes not always getting it right, but also having thick skin and having people to go to um, when, when you're on the struggle bus. Vinnie Aurora knows I always have to reach out to her and be like, Vinnie, and she's my, my um, antidote to the imposter syndrome. Um, I, that, that has really um, been a positive thing too, so I'll stop there. Let me just make a couple of summary comments because Daniel's got that, that look. He holding up uh, the signs to us <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> First of all, thank you. That was, that was, that was great. The, um, I forgot who said it yesterday, but we have to teach the influencers science. Yeah, we have to teach the scientists influence. I mean, there's just no question that for us to sort of say, this is the way we've always done things, this is how we get information out, we do rigorous science, we don't say anything unless we're 100% sure with no confidence in interval, just not gonna work. And so I think learning from the people that have done this work and building curricula and getting people to see what works and what doesn't work is important. It's also important to recognize that you don't come out on day one and have 100,000 followers. You know, it is a slow build and people can't be uh, too disappointed early on by not having influence, it builds over time, and it's something that you have to stick with. And the th third, and maybe the final observation, and this is sort of cause of for introspection for all of us, uh, 
you know, I'm amazed at what social media does in terms of sort of the level of uh, impact you have, but I'm not convinced that I am changing the minds of a whole lot of the people that we're talking about here. I think, you know, the 280,000 people that follow me probably have decided that they like what I tend to think about and are, are, are in sync with the things I'm thinking about. And so it's sort of a whole different, and, and then, you know, having a decent social media following is then what gets the New Yorker and the New York Times and the Washington uh, Post to call you and Politico to call you because that's, that's what they're following to see who they should speak to. But again, the people we're trying to reach here, most of them are not reach, reading the New Yorker and Politico. They're, they have other information outlets. So in some ways, the biggest and most daunting problem here is the fact that everybody can choose their own information adventure and that even if you are successful in having the influence you have, and obviously you're reaching some other communities, which is spectacular, but the people that are not taking vaccines or, or whatever it is that we're trying to uh, promote, I'm not sure that we have cracked the code of that, those information ecosystems. But people pass the baton in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and I know you're about to hold this on up. I'll be fast, I promise. Um, when Daniel starts throwing the I baton, know, that's, throwing that's when okay, we know we really, really got to go. So, and this is just a, a really quick story of an, of an example. So um, again, I mentioned I use Facebook as myself. People that I went to college with, medical school, in my community know me there. Um, but I also say things about the medical community. But again, I'm mission driven in that space because I know who the audience is. Was working one day, was trying to talk to um, a, a nurse in the hospital about mRNA vaccines gave her an explanation of how they worked. She was like, that was really helpful to me. I like the way you broke that down. I walked into my office, took my phone out, and then I made this video explaining mRNA vaccines in my own words and posted it to Facebook. It was shared all over the place. Now, first it was like the Facebook group, but then what happened was people would show it in churches. They'd be like, oh, I was at church in Huntsville, Alabama with my grandmama, and they showed your video, and I said, oh, that's my sorority sister from Tuskegee. Um, so I actually started finding that I was in spaces where people saw something from Twitter, but they saw it because somebody moved it over here, or they showed it in church, or they put it in a newsletter. So I also think that we have to um, um, be really good stewards of our influence, particularly when we are really um, embedded in communities, because people will take what you have and then they will get it to folks. They'll get it over to WhatsApp, they will get it over to where wherever it needs to be. So I'm a little bit hopeful about the passing of the baton and sometimes thinking about how even the language that we use, that it could be even adjusted so that even if it does reach that non-Twitter, med Twitter audience, it could get to somebody else and they could really be like, oh yeah, that resonated with me.